Okay. Some more inverse functions. Um, so far we've only worked on inverse functions when the function were both either cosines or sines. So we've done problems like this. Okay, where the two matched. Well, today <coughs> we're going to work to do cosines and tangents, for example. So to do this, I strongly suggest that you draw a picture. If you don't draw a picture, you might get lost. Um, I can't do this without a picture, but if you can without and you're getting right answers, that's fine. But if you're not sure, just draw a picture. Okay, first thing that you want to look at is, is this thing over here. So keep in mind that the inverse tangent of 3 over 4, what does that return? That's going to give me an, an angle. Okay, so that actually means that the tangent of the angle came out to be what? 3 over 4. With the 3 being your... Maria, bring me your phone. With the 3 being your what? Opposite. And the 4 being your... Adjacent. Okay, so what quadrant am I in? If the tangent's positive, you must be in quadrant 1. Okay, the tangent and the sine are nice because in, at least if you're negative, you're rotating negatively. You're in quadrant 4. If you're positive, you're rotating positively. So we are in quadrant 1, and we have this is your 3, and this is your 4. Okay, then hopefully you can see that this is your 5, right? Do you need this 5? Well, yeah, because really what I'm trying to do here is find the cosine of some angle, because I can replace all of that with, with theta. Well, what is the cosine of the angle? Which is 4 over 5. Well, there's your answer. So, draw a picture. In some cases, you'll need to find a missing side. Find it. When well, all the cases, actually, on these, probably. And then just find, based on your picture, find the cosine or the sine or the whatever we're asked for. So they special terms. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But notice on this one, you don't really need, you don't even need to know what the angle is. At no point am I going to try to figure out what angle I have right there, because I just need the picture so I can find the relationship of the sides. Right. Uh, sometimes it could be a special triangle, but all of these are going to give you two, right? Yep. So since you always get two sides, you can always find the third side with Pythagorean theorem. Okay, which you'll see me do here next. So how does it work on this one? Well, sort of the same thing. So I'm going to start by rewriting this thing again. Okay, so this is the sine of something, or the inverse sine is going to give me an angle. So that means that the sine of the angle is a negative 2 over 5. Since I'm at a negative, what quadrant am I in? Four. I must be in quadrant 4. Okay, so you are in quadrant 4. So draw the angle in quadrant 4. In quadrant 4, the sine being the opposite over the hypotenuse. Uh, that's probably not in the right spot. It doesn't matter too much, but it's usually nice to have it somewhat reasonably accurate. So if that's a negative 2, and let's make that our 5, not nearly as steep. So that's 5. Now what am I supposed to find? Well, here's your angle. So we place this with the tangent of an angle. What's the tangent of this angle? Well, I need to find this side, don't I? Because I need opposite over adjacent. So x squared will be 5 squared minus a negative 2 squared. So x is the square root of 25 minus 4, which is the square root of 21, which you may leave. So x is the square root of 21. What's the tangent of this angle now? Okay. And it's a negative because it's in the quadrant 4. If that had been the cosine, I would actually have a positive value here. So this is the reason you want to make sure you draw it in the right quadrant because depending on the quadrant you're in, the signs will change, you know, whether you get positives or negative. Okay, although I don't believe you need to memorize it, <coughs> you should at least be able to connect quickly from cosine to inverse cosine and sine to inverse sine and tangent to inverse tangent. It'll help you figure out um, what quadrants you're supposed to be in 
for these things. So, what domain did we look at for the cosine so that it was one to one? The cosine was one to one from zero to to pi, so that the inverse exists, so that you can just swap these two out. Okay, so if you know that the inver or the domain for the cosine runs from zero to pi, then the inverse always returns an angle between zero and pi. So you should never write a negative pi over three for the inverse cosine. It's impossible. It doesn't return that. The range for the cosine is from a negative one to one, so that is your domain for the inverse cosine. Okay, so hopefully you understand that the sine works just the same way at least in terms of domain and ranges or ranges and domains of those two. Where is the sine one to one? Okay, so that ends up what comes out of an inverse sine. So when I ask you guys what do I get out of an inverse sine, you should always think, well, somewhere between a negative pi over two and pi over two. How about your tangent? What do we look for for the tangent? Between which values? Pi over 2 and pi over 2 again. So that ends up being the range here. So you're all the rates in quadrants 1 or 4 for your inverse tangent. And what do you get out of it? All real numbers, right? Isn't that the tangents graph? All real numbers. You guys have questions on that stuff? Most of that's done on Friday. But yes, this is supposed to be reviewed from Friday. Okay, here's the new part. This table. The same logic, the same reasoning that we applied to Friday applies also to secants, cosecants, and cotangents. Okay. However, you can just run through what do these things relate to. So the secant relates to what? Cosine. It relates to the cosine. Okay, so when it was the cosine one to one? From zero to pi, right? Okay, so that means that the secant will also be 1 to 1 from 0 to pi. Okay, so what I'm listing here is sort of the domain. So what do I get out of a secant? And I might have to switch this graph, but so the cosine, if we go from 0 to pi, the cosine would look like this, right? Yes? Okay, so that's how far we went from 0 to pi for the cosine. Then when we flip this, we would get an asymptote here, wouldn't we? And so this is what we're going to look at for our secant. It's sort of a weird graph, but this is the graph for the secant so that we have an inverse secant. We only look at from here to here. So what is the range? What is the range for the secant? So that's the domain. What is the range for the secant? Well, not all real numbers. The range for the secant, this is 1, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a negative 1. So we get from 1 up and from a negative 1 down. You guys see that? That's the range for the secant? Okay. Well, the easiest way to write that is to say that the absolute value of y is always greater than or equal to 1. This range becomes the domain for the inverse secant, right? You swap x's and y's. Okay, so the absolute value of x is always greater than or equal to 1. The 0 to pi, that's the easier one here. This one just matches up this way. Okay, so your domain and range for your secant are right here in this little table. They're also in the table above there. 
That's what it says here. Y is inverse secant. That means that this is true. So x has to be greater than or equal to 1. Well, that comes out of the fact that you can have this thing here and that it's between 0 and pi. And then this is over here because we get an undefined value, right? You should never tell me pi over 2 all of an inverse secant. It's impossible. How about your cosecant? So your cosecant relates to the sine. the sine, and the sine is graphed one to one from negative pi over two to pi over two. So that means that the cosecant we're also only going to look from a negative pi over two to pi over two. Are you guys okay with that? Basically, you got the same picture here, same idea except it it flips a little bit. Um, so I'm out of room there. So what I mean with that is the following. So if I were to graph my sine from a negative power over 2 to power over 2, the sine would look like this. But you guys, is that okay that that's my sine? So when you flip this, you get this. So that is the graph that you should sort of have for your cosecant, with your asymptote being right smack in the middle here, okay? Because you can't have a sine of zero for your cosecant. Okay, that means the. F so what do we now then know for the inverse cosecant? So since we know that the domain for the cosecant is from a negative power over two to power over two, you know that the range for the inverse is what? Same thing. Okay, so now we just need to worry about the range here. Well, the cosecant's range is the same as the secant. You notice it does the same thing. It goes from a negative one on down. It goes from a positive one on up. So, um, so we're going to write that as the absolute value of y is greater than or e equal to negative one. I mean one, sorry. So that part's the same for both of these. So the absolute value of y is greater than or equal to one. So it's either one, negative one, or, or bigger than that. So on this one, that's what your domain is. So you should always put a number larger than 1 into your cosecant, or larger, or more negative than a negative 1. Okay, that, that leaves then with the cotangent. Well, the cotangent is very similar to the tangent. When you graph the cotangent, so when we graph the cotangent, we always make it run from 0 to pi, right? So here's the regular graph for the cotangent. So what do you notice about this graph in terms of one to one? Is it one to one? Yeah. Well, then we can just flip this one. We can literally just exchange x's and y's. Okay, the cotangent is one to one. We don't have to force it. So that means that the inverse cotangent is gonna just flip all these things. So the cotangent runs from zero to pi so the inverse cotangent is going to return numbers between 0 and pi. And what do we get for the cotangent? The output is any value, right? So just like the tangent, the cotangent can take any, or the inverse cotangent can take any value in it. So can you find the inverse cotangent of a negative 1,000? Sure. That's okay. Just know that the angle that it returns is going to be between 0 and pi. Okay, so how does all that work? in terms of doing a problem. All right. Find the exact value of the inverse cotangent of a negative 1. So it's supposed to give me an angle. And until you get comfortable with it, I would start, I would just keep writing this little bit here. You probably want to graph it anyway. So what quadrant am I supposed to be in to get a negative cotangent? I think it's 2, isn't it? Didn't we just sort of say that we're going to go from 0 to pi for the inverse cotangent? It always returns one of these, so the number between these two. Okay, and if that's a negative 1, then this is your negative 1, and that's your positive 1. Sorry, I missed that over there. So, let's make it at least hit over there. So, what angle do I have here? 45. 
which is a pi over 4, right? But I'm in quadrant 3, so it's 1, 2, 3 pi over 4. The answer to this should be 3 pi over 4. Okay, if you struggle with this, draw a picture. Figure out the quadrant first. Okay, I don't like this expression here. I'm going to divide by, and this is one reason you, you don't, I don't want you to rationalize anyway. Um, these two things are the same. The reason they're the same is because if you divide this by the square root of 3, it cancels. And 3 divided by the square root of 3 is the square root of 3. Okay, why would I write it this way? Well, this one is a special triangle that I know. The other one, not sure. Okay, so the cosecant is, is what in terms of opposites, adjacents, and all of that? If you're not sure, it relates to your sine, and the sine would be? Over hypotenuse. So this is actually the hypotenuse, and this is my opposite side over here. Okay, so that's part one. Next part, it's negative. What quadrant must you be in? You're in fourth. It relates to the sine, so it's supposed to give me an angle between a negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So here's your negative 2. Sorry, here's your negative square root of 3. That's your opposite side. And then this would be your 2. What angle do I have? This would be a 1. So the angle is 60, right? Okay, that would be pi over 3. Which way did we rotate? And that's your answer. The inverse cosecant here will be a negative pi over 3. Okay. We have a bunch of problems that are like all single, so yeah, it's a long list of what you're supposed to be doing. Sign. That's impossible. Doesn't happen.